My name is Eric Bullock and I will be going through module 2.7 estimation of uncertainties. I am currently a researcher at Boston University and my work deals with land cover change monitoring and area estimation using remote sensing data. So this module is very relevant to my own work. Under respect for time, I will not be going over every slide in the module, but will instead focus on the central themes and important takeaways. I try to Im only omit information that I believe to be straightforward from reading the slides. So here is an outline of the module. The lecture starts with a brief overview of the importance of identifying uncertainties with special regards to uncertainties in the IPCC and UNFCCC context. After understanding the importance, we move on to some general concepts and then differentiating between uncertainties in area change estimates and in estimates of carbon stocks and carbon stock changes. Finally, we finish with some considerations to the process of combining uncertainties across different stages in the emission estimation process. All right, so to start with, importance of identifying uncertainties. In the IPCC and UNFCCC context, uncertainty is defined as a lack of knowledge about the true value of a parameter, such as area or carbon stock. Why is this important? Well, according to good practices, the IPCC requires greenhouse gas inventories to be neither over nor underestimated and to have uncertainties that are reduced as far as practically possible. I believe that this slide contains the fundamental information for the module, so it's worth taking some time with. The first part of the second bulletin point, that the inventories contain neither over nor under estimates so far as can be judged, could also be called a bias. By this I mean that the method used in creating an estimate of carbon change or area change is biased to systematically under or over, or over represent the true value. I will go into detail a little later as to why this might happen, but it is important to remember that according to good practices, this bias is recognized and eliminated. The process of uncertainty estimation allows for the calculation of this bias and then the adjustment of the estimates to remove it. Once again, I will go into detail into what I mean by this later on the lecture. The second part of the bullet point is a little more straightforward. The uncertainty is to be reduced as much as practicable. Practi practical. Practical. And only through estimation of uncertainties can this be realized. All right, so moving on. By identifying and calculating uncertainties, one could also assess the robustness of a greenhouse gas inventory and locate weaknesses in the methodologies that can, prior that can be prioritized when trying to improve upon the system. Additionally, uncertainty information allows for the calculation of lower bound estimates, a conservative estimate of emissions. By that I mean region. And since we want to be conservative with our estimates, then we then the value you report it could be the lower bound of that. So building off these introductory concepts, the aim of this module is to explain the basic ideas and methods behind the identification, quantification, and combination of activities for both activity data or area change or area and area change estimates and emission factors or carbon stock and carbon. Useful vision. Uncertainties. These are accuracy and precision. Accuracy is defined as the agreement between the estimates and the true values. If something is systematically inaccurate in that the mean of the estimates deviates consistently from the mean of the true values, then it is said to be biased. This would result in this would be the result of flaws in the measurement or sampling methodologies. The second aspect is precision which is agreement between repeated measurements of the estimate. If repeated measurements do not agree or have large variance, then their precision is low, and the methodology is said to have large random error. This should be reduced as much as possible. As shown in the figure, it is possible to be only accurate, it is possible to be only accurate, only precise, or both. Ideally, we want C in the figure, both accurate and precise. Through uncertainty calculation, we could calculate unbiased estimates to achieve a situation that looks like A, and we could also use the information to improve upon the methodology to reduce the random error to move to a situation that looks more like C. So systematic errors, or biases, should be avoided, but could also be quantified after the facts are removed. 
Random error tends to be less important as you increase in levels of aggregation. So the larger the area you are estimating over, the less important random errors usually are. There are some caveats to this, but it is usually the case. Additionally, improvements upon the estimation regime often focus on reducing random errors or increasing precision. So what I was talking about before with the region that we believe the estimates to be in beyond a certain confidence level is also known as the confidence interval, often expressed as a 95% confidence interval. This means that 95% of estimates from the same sampling design will include the true value. This can be calculated and expressed as something such as an area in hectares plus or minus a percent, meaning 95% of sampled estimates will be plus or minus that percent from the area stated. That is kind of wordy, so an example would be 100 hectares plus or minus 20%, in which 95% confidence interval is 80 to 120 hectares. Going back to what I was saying before, if you are trying to be conservative with your estimates, you would report 80 hectares as a conservative value, or 100 hectares hectares with a stated confidence interval. Okay, changing gears slightly now, trend uncertainty means the uncertainty in the change of emissions between multiple periods of time. This is similar to any sort of uncertainty, but is restricted to that of the change in emissions or removals. In this example, if the trend is 5%, but with a 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 2%, then the trend uncertainty would also be plus or minus 2%. Going back to what I've been talking about with respect to conservative estimates, the conservative's concept is used to reduce the risk of overestimating the true value of emission reduction. Good practices requires that between over and underestimating emission reductions should be underestimated. Uncertainty, estimate, uh, uncertainty estimation can verify that the estimate reported is not an overrepresentation of the true value. All right, three, uncertainty in area change estimates or activity data. In the red plus context, area and area change estimates come from maps derived from remote sensing data. Due to clouds and other image noise, the absence of training data, and general shortcomings in classification techniques, there are often biases in the estimates. The accuracy of these maps can be assessed through an accuracy assessment, and the results can be used to remove the bias in the area estimates. The assessment results can also be used to tune the parameters in the classification technique, but this is also often subjective to the technician and will never result in a perfect classification regime. So diving into the accuracy assessment a little bit. As indicated, all maps based on remotely sensed data include classification errors, and the role of the accuracy assessment is to characterize the frequency of errors for each land cover class in the map. Each class may have errors of both omission and commission, and in most situations, the errors of omission and commission for the class are not equal. Differences in these two, two errors may be used to adjust area estimates and also to understand, or also to estimate the uncertainties or confidence intervals for the areas of each class. Adjusting area estimates on the basis of a rigorous accuracy assessment represents an improvement over simply reporting the area of map classes. Because areas of land cover change are important drivers or emission, providing the best possible estimates of these areas is critical. For an accuracy assessment of, of a land cover map, one requirement is independent reference data to compare a sample of the data to and assign each sample a class label based on that reference data. It is important for the reference data to be of higher quality of the map, meaning better spatial, temporal, or radiometric resolution. The assessment will quantify the amount of errors of omission, or errors resulting in an area excluded from the class that it truly belongs to, and errors of commission, or errors resulting in an area included in a class that does not belong. This slide shows an example of an error matrix of sample counts for hypothetical land use classification. From this error matrix, the errors of commission, omission, user's accuracy, producer's accuracy, and over, overall class accuracy can be calculated. For land cover changes, some additional details need to be considered. First, multi-temporal reference data is needed to create labels for classifications before and after a land cover change. This is also more difficult and can be more expensive than obtaining single date reference data. Additionally, the changes that are being assessed are often very small in area, so validating 
can be complicated and usually requires a stratified sample that allocates enough sample to small land cover changes or small land cover change classes to provide confidence in the estimates. However, this means it is easier to look for to look at areas of change and determine their validity than to find missed areas of change in areas labeled as stable. Finally, technical limitations in multi-temporal data, such as er errors in geolocation between images, are more frequent in change assessments. So sources of uncertainty, continuing. Many components of a monitoring system affect the quality of the estimates that could lead to higher or lower uncertainties. I will not list all that is written here, but basically the slide is outlining some of the technical aspects of area change and emission calculation that increase your uncertainties. Some of these are based on decisions from the reporting agency, such as minimum mapping unit and land cover category definition. Some are based on technical limitations based on data acquisition, and some can be improved through expansion of the monitoring system and the inclusion of higher quality reference data or remote sensing data for analysis. So errors in area change estimates. This visual shows how two maps at two different time periods can appear correct in total forest or non-forest area, but individual errors in each map will be combined in the change map, making the change map have more errors than either individual map. For this reason, map differentiating is not usually re recommended as a means of obtaining activity data. To elaborate on this a little bit, there are generally two ways of obtaining spatially explicit area change data. What I spoke about in the previous slide could be referred to as post-classification or map comparison. An alternative is direct classification, in which the multi-temporal data is combined and the change is directly classified. I will not go into the details of how this is technical, technically achieved, but I would recommend the GFOI methods and guidance document for further information. An accuracy assessment can be broken up into three different components. In the sampling design, the, the sample, sampling design, response design, and analysis design. These are referred to as designs and not something like stages because they involve user-defined choices on how they are implemented depending on the map that is being assessed in the project goal. The sampling design is a protocol for selecting the locations in which the reference data are obtained. There are some decisions that should be considered when deciding on a sampling design, including the proportion of total area of the important classes. So if they are small relative to the classes that you do not care as much about, then a stratified sample is recommended. And cost. If you wish to use very high resolution reference data, then a systematic two-stage sample could be preferable. This is a very large topic in itself, so I'll not try to explain it all here, but the important part is that generally a probability-based stratified sample is preferred, with some exceptions that should be considered prior to sampling. Response design. The response design is a set of protocols that determine if your map label map matches a reference label on the ground. For example, what percent of the sample pixel needs to be a certain land cover for it to be assigned to that class? In General, the reference information should come from data that is higher in quality than what was used to make the map. That does not mean necessarily that it needs to be of higher spatial resolution or ground data. If a map is made with a single Landsat image, but a time series of Landsat images is used to assign reference label, then that is okay because the added information from the temporal domain makes it higher in quality than what was used to make the map. Analysis design. So finally, the analysis design is the procedure for estimating accuracies and also for using the accuracies to adjust the class areas to remove biases in the map. So not only are accuracy metrics developed, but they are also used to make the area estimates compliant with the IPCC, IPCC guideline that they not be over or underestimated or contain a systematic bias. So that was uncertainties in area change estimates. Now moving on to carbon stock change estimates. In general, uncertainties in carbon stock changes tend to be more difficult to obtain and are higher than those of area change. This is because, in part, the systematic biases are harder to account for because the procedure cannot be sampled and assessed in a similar, similar way to an area change map. So just like area change estimates, there are both random and systematic errors in estimating carbon stocks. However, they may be a little more difficult to distinguish between. 
This chart shows the differences, the different sources of uncertainties as sort of a spectrum between random and systematic errors, in which some may be partially included in both. Random errors can be caused simply by limitations of the instruments and methodologies used. There is no way to directly measure biomass across large, large areas, so it needs to be inferred based on other variables that can be measured from remote sensing satellites or through field plots. The robustness of field plots depends upon many factors, including the accessibility of the forest, and there is always going to be variation in the forest, so if the plots are not frequent enough, then they may not capture this variability. Carbon stock estimation generally involves some sort of tree elementary, which relates a measurable variable of the tree, such as dBH or height to biomass. These are based on field samples and are location and species specific. Even a plot specific allometric equation is not going to be perfect, so the higher in scale you start to aggregate the equation to, the higher the error from this conversion will be. Two ways to deal with random errors that I mentioned are to increase the sample size and to use as location specific an allometric equation as possible. However, both of these are not always technically feasible. Moving to systematic errors, it is often very difficult to give an accurate measure of the total carbon pool, since in many cases above ground biomass is easiest to measure but only contains a relatively small proportion of the total carbon. This will lead to a bias in underestimating the carbon pool. Below ground biomass, soil, organic carbon, dead wood, and litter can be estimated based on the above ground biomass but often with higher uncertainty. As I mentioned before, it is important to have a representative sample of field plots due to the high variation of biomass in tropical forests. However, the areas with the largest variance often are also the, the hardest to get to, so this might not always be feasible. Systematically sampling areas that are easier to get to but also lower in biomass could lead to a bias to underrepresent the total carbon pool. Also, not having a full representative sample will lead to a lack of precision between plots. So this is an example of how uncertainty can be both a random and a systematic error. All right, finally, the combination of uncertainties. There are two IPCC tiers defined for combining uncertainties, and these are Tier 1, which is error propagation, and Tier 2, Monte Carlo simulation. Error propagation is easier to implement and involves a combination of uncertainties at all the various stages of the process to create a final estimate of the total uncertainty. Monte Carlo simulation is based on repeated sampling in a computer model, and is more difficult to implement because it requires more complex computer programs. So Tier 1, like I mentioned before, is much simpler than Tier 2 and can be implemented in a computer spreadsheet. It is only applicable if the estimates are based on addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And if so, there are a set of equations that can be used to propagate the uncertainties across stages. This slide lists some guidelines to when Tier 1 is applicable, but I think it's important to note that even if one of the conditions is not met, but Tier 2 is not possible due to te technical limitations, then Tier 1 can still be done to get approximate results. If one has access to a statistical software such as R or SAS, then Tier 2 could be used and is preferable. There is an enormous amount of literature on Monte Carlo simulation, so I'll not try to explain it all here, but the takeaway message is that if, if possible to implement Tier 2, then it will give more accurate results. To give a brief summary of what a Monte Carlo simulation is, it means a form of analysis that selects random values of model variables based on the probability density function of that variable and calculates the corresponding emission values. This, this procedure is repeated many, many times, and that is why it is called a Monte Carlo simulation. Based on, sim based, based on these simulations, the mean emission estimate can be obtained with a confidence interval. The lower the uncertainty of the area change in carbon change estimates, the smaller the range of the confidence interval will be. And then there's a standardized format that the uncertainty should be reported in. As you see here, for a given land cover conversion, such as forest to cropland, you have an emission removal for two different years, and then the uncertainty in the area and emission factor, and then combined uncertainty. This is followed by inventory trend, followed by trend uncertainty. This is done for each land cover category, and then a total is given at the bottom. In summary, while it might not be the most exciting part to everyone, assessing uncertainties is a fundamental part of the emission estimate process. It consists of both systematic and random errors. 
Random errors can be reduced as much as possible, as can systematic errors, which can also be quantified and used to remove biases in the estimates. This is done for land cover and land cover change data using an accuracy assessment to char characterize the frequency of errors in the data. And then uncertainties in carbon stock and stock changes is often larger and more difficult to quantify than in area change estimates, but regardless, they should be identified and quantified whenever possible. And the final step is a combination of uncertainties, which can be done either through error propagation or Monte Carlo analysis. So I hope this presentation was helpful. I apologize for skipping over some topics, but I try my best to focus on the key takeaways from the module. Thanks.